thank you so much, Aaron. That was an incredible introduction. And thank you everyone for joining. So I'm going to read some poems from Seasons of Love Around the Rising Sun. The first poem I'm reading is called Kayobi Tuesday. And I wrote this during the pandemic. And during the pandemic, we did Zoom bedtime stories between members of our family, like my mom or my dad um, and my son, so that they could still have that connection. And this describes one of those bedtime stories. Kayobi, Tuesday. The bedtime story isn't told perching on the edge of his white clean mattress or from the dinosaur bean bag in the corner of his room. She doesn't need to avoid the creaky floorboard on the way out. Instead, as his eyelids flutter and he steals away to today and yesterday, to what will and could be, she peers into the screen and watches his grip on Kumachang loosen as one by one his fingers drop. Once his shallow breathing beats a regular rhythm, he's yume no naka in his dreams. She stays a while, drinking him in from the other side of the town, singing komori uta, a lullaby, and brushing her fingers across the stuffed totoro he left at hers a year ago, only intended for a short stay to be washed properly. He hasn't been picked up yet. She tries to recall the feather of his cheek, the tickle of his overgrown mop, his heaviness on her lap, the scent of the soap he uses for eczema. When the screen flickers and she's staring into darkness, she thinks of Kayobi, Hatiji, next Tuesday, eight o'clock, and it wraps futon like around her and keeps her warm. The next poem I'm reading is called Tadaima, I'm Home. And this um, is inspired by returning to my grandparents' house in Tokyo. And every time I would see my grandmother and we would sort of go through the same rituals of coming home. <clears throat> Tadaima, I'm home. On the way to your house in Nakano, I heard the slurp of salarymen as they sat at ramen bars, backs hunched over bowls like blackbirds in a line. Dim lanterns from each izakaya guided the way to yours. They swayed in the breeze of September as if the heat of the summer had been a dream. I knew I was coming home. My key turned in the lock and I saw you turn and smile. Your slippers were laid out, facing forwards for me to wear, so I could slip into how we used to be. I neared the kitchen and the scent of your vegetable tempura swirled with steam from the rice cooker, your blue apron stained with greasy handprints. I knew I was coming home. I went upstairs to change into the yukata you laid out for me. Creaseless and clean, I brushed my hair and washed my face. When I came downstairs, you had made hojicha tea. I raised the china cup to my lips and scalded them. The leaves danced in the ceramic, drifting towards me. And when your hand touched my cheek and you whispered, Okairi nasai, my face was awash with tears. I knew I was coming home. My next poem is called Susumu, um, and this is a sonnet that is unfortunately based on a true story um, of a neighbor of my grandparents' house in Tokyo. Susumu. The sun beat down on Tokyo intensely, 45 in the shade. The matsu tree stretched out across Susumu's back garden, providing relief from the scorching heat. Susumu's dad had finally convinced him to have the minor operation. Yarinasai, he'd growled. Don't be a coward. Susumu was frightened but had no choice. They hadn't expected his reaction to the anaesthetic on the table. Samurais fall on swords and show weakness. The old lie was exposed and the old man wept under the branches shading his face from the fire that watched Icarus fall.
My next poem is called Tombot Dragonflies. Um, and this was inspired by um, my grandfather's passing. And it came from a conversation I had with my mother when she said before they put my grandfather in the coffin, they checked his wallet and they made sure there were no pictures of the grandchildren inside because culturally, well, they believe in Japan that you'll be pulled to the other side if there are pictures of you that go with them. So she talked about removing everyone's picture from his wallet. And then um, this reminded me of sort of moments with my grandfather. Tombot Dragonflies. At Myo-Onji Shrine in Tokyo, the dragonflies dance around my head. We're here to place granddad's ashes into the family burial site. The September breeze rises and falls and rises again. I hold a photograph in my hand, faded and folded. When they placed granddad in his coffin, they removed the picture of me from his wallet so he wouldn't pull me over to the other side. In the picture, I'm a gap-toothed six-year-old next to Taro the dog, although if he was still with us, perhaps I'm five. It was a warm late summer day when Grandad took the photograph. We had planned an adventure in the hills of Navano to hunt dragonflies and eat our omosubi rice balls by the lake. The tombo swarmed thickly around us. We caught them in our long necked nets to study them in giant glass jars. At sunset, Grandad said it was time to release them. Everything belongs back where it comes from. Taro barked as they flew into the peach red sky. They mingled with the fireflies, just then beginning to inflame the evening. I hold this picture in my hand, and as the monk pours the grey dust and chants a prayer, the dragonflies dance around my head. This next poem is called Signs, and this is about um, the breakdown of a relationship and all the signs that you see or maybe you don't see in everything in the lead up to that breakdown. Signs. We came for the soba noodles, but they stick to the bottom of the bowl. The spider crabs crawl peacefully over Mibaru Beach unaware of the storm that's rising over the ocean. When we board the boat, I wave to a whale. I'd read that they respond to signals. Sure enough, it comes up starboard, splashing and spraying us from its blowhole. I say that I asked the whale to join us. You don't respond. Perhaps the salty air carried my words away. The trip to Okinawa only began this morning. It's already clear. We came for the soba noodles, but they stick to the bottom of the bowl. This poem is called Yudoshi Forgiveness. And when you dream of someone, whether you can have a conversation with them, this is the sort of <laughs> idea that the poem came from. <clears throat> Yudoshi, forgiveness. Last night, I dreamt of you. You were turned away as we spoke. I couldn't see your face. You were kneeling on the floor, facing the Fusuma door as it slid shut, closing on all my mistakes. I heard your voice, as rough as the scales of salmon, you'd grab with yellow rubber gloves as she swam upstream. I felt the brush of your shoulder as I reached for you to explain, but you didn't move. I tasted the bitter dregs of hojicha tea left to brew all evening. And when my forehead touched the tatami floor in apology, you were turned away. I couldn't see your face. The next poem is called Mizu Water. Um, and this is inspired by Japanese calligraphy, 
which is a real art form, and how people or children might practice with water. Um, and then it got me thinking about if you try and write someone's name with kanji, how um, it might disappear before you can finish it. <clears throat> Mizu Water. I wrote the kanji of your name in water on a paving stone. Each brush stroke a prayer to heal you. The sun stole the first letter before I finished. It was impossible to compose your name in full, even when I raced through it. Life, one second within the stretches of time, a droplet that splashes, stains and fades, ending almost as soon as it begins. Um, I'm wondering if I have time for one more, Aaron, or whether I should hand over. Just okay, I have time for one more. Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, this poem is called Heat Transferring, which I wrote during the pandemic after many years of not writing poetry. I used to write poetry a lot when I was younger, um, secretly, never sharing it with anyone. And then after a long period of working and studying. And then suddenly with the, pandem with the pandemic, I was at home with my own thoughts a lot and I started writing poetry. And this was the first poem that I wrote and then that led to writing more because I got the bug. Um, so this is Heat Transferring, inspired again, like my first poem by um, my mother and my son. She peeks in the window. He's busy, surrounded by colorful bricks. Inside it's warm and the fire keeps out the cold January frost. He spots her and beams and rushes to the pain. He knows by now he can't dash to the door. Two hands meet on the glass, hers shriveled, wrinkly and well-worn, the hand that fed, clothed and bathed me. His chubby and pen-stained, still alternately clinging to my legs and pounding the floor in frustration. For a moment, the world stops and these two souls, two sides of me collide gently. She tells him silently how much she misses him and he does the same. The icy glass begins to warm under their palms until it's time for her to leave, to stay safe, to stay apart. Long after she's gone, the handprint remains there, as warm and comforting as the promise of spring and brighter times to come. Thank you.